Good afternoon. Welcome to SEA's webinar with Oscar Lopez Gamendi on the evolution of isolated carbonate buildups. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the democratics of the audience. So I have some polling questions that I will launch. And uh, the first question is, what's your primary discipline? So we'd like you to answer either petroleum engineering, geoscience, facility engineering, petrophysics, or other. Looks like we have most of the votes in, and the majority of you are geoscientists, about 89% geoscientists. So I will close that poll, and let me ask the next question. How many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? So we have a range of responses. Quite a few of you have over 30 years experience, uh, but we have some in the other group. The next highest group is 38% of you have 11 to 20 years experience, and most of you have voted. So I will go ahead and share those answers and then close the polls. So again, welcome to today's webinar. And uh, you're attending an SCA webinar. This is one of a series of webinars that we've presented over the past several months. And we have Dr. Oscar Lopez Gamende, who will be presenting today. He also has a course that he'll be presenting in September in Houston on carbonate stratigraphy, sedimentology, and strategic sequence stratigraphy. And uh, we look forward to listening to his presentation. After today's presentation, you will have a chance to ask questions. So please use the Q&A feature on your panel to ask the questions. And we will present those at the end of the webinar. So without any further ado, I'm going to give Dr. Lopez Gamende the presentation rights and ask him to start his presentation. Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you. So, we'll start uh, morning or afternoon, wherever you guys are. Uh, this is just a, a little chat about uh, how this very particular uh, buildups, isolated carbonate buildups, uh, evolve, they form and evolve. And I picked this topic that is obviously embedded in the, in the course. Because I think there are, there are several uh, breakthroughs in the last uh, eight to ten years on the way we see and understand carbonate buildups, and particularly those that are isolated, which are very uh, very peculiar and very important in exploration. Just to make sure that we are all on the same page, uh, what you see there is a worldwide distribution of carbonates in general. They're very sensitive to uh, temperature of the seawater. Uh, and as you can see, there are two big main families, the reefs and the shelf carbonates. Uh, shelf carbon is also known as uh, olytic shoals, if you're familiar with that uh, concept. And they are, from the hydrodynamic point of view, similar. They were similar uh, to silicic plastic sands. And then we have the reefs, as you can see there. Uh, all the carbonates are. Uh, are developed in areas where sediment, plastic sediment input is minimum. So you can you can go along a, a coastline and see where you have deltas, estuaries, but essentially uh, deltas, and you see how they interrupt uh, uh, carbonate sedimentation. That's just to give you a general framework. What we have there is uh, briefly uh, what kind of uh, subtype we will be uh, looking at. And this is uh, a very classic classification of uh, carbonate system tracks. But more importantly than the sequence stratigraphic point of view, uh, what I want to emphasize is the geometry of, of this uh, system tracks. And what I have uh, highlighted there in, uh, in red is what uh, the topic of our conversation today, which is the isolated platform. Just to give you an idea of what isolated platforms have in common 
with what we call here uh, carbonate rims in general is the steep slopes. And we will see that in seismic, which is a very peculiar seismic facies and very peculiar geometry that you, uh, you will be able to identify. On the other end, you have carbonate ramps attached to, to continents most of the times and uh, uh, defined by very gentle slopes. So one of the key uh, identifiers in subsurfaces this, uh, of this isolated platform, and in general, all the reef margin uh, carbonate plates is uh, this uh, steep slopes that you don't see in uh, siliciclastic systems. So what we are, are looking at here is, is, I would say, it's a gamut of this transition from what we just described as ramps, a very, a very low slope carbonate systems, to what we normally call a rim shell or, or, or reef margins, and is what you have there in the in this transition here that where my cursor is, with the classic uh, subdivision of a, a continent, a lagoon, a reef margin, and then the slope. And then we keep going, and here are the isolated platforms or isolated carbonate buildups, which is what we will be discussing. Also, notice that uh, what you have in terms of reservoir, you have potential. The most important potential in terms of reservoirs are those uh, lithologies that are in red here in this diagram. Sorry, in uh, in blue, which is reef patch reefs shows and the secondary objective is this olytic shows that i just described in the first slide about the two dominant carbonate types uh, within that uh, latitudinal belt and then the third objective in terms of aspiration is the gravity reworked material of uh, the reef margin to the slopes and that is here in an orange or you know pale brown uh, color, which is resedimented deep water greenstone. So th this is what we will be looking at in uh, in detail. But I just want to emphasize the the transition between one one type uh, and another. So the main characteristic of isolated carbonate buildups or ICBs are obviously created by organic activity. Therefore, like any other uh, carbonate buildup. Is, is constrained to the photic zone, an area we go, that it depends on turbidity, but it goes from five, eight, 10, a little bit more meters below uh, the seawater. And that's where uh, this uh, carbonates, these uh, buildups uh, flourish. Usually they have two types of porosities, we'll discuss those, maldic and buggy. Uh, carbonate porosity is, is a discipline in itself. And it's dominated in uh, unlike plastics and shallow uh, depth. Carbonates are are highly influenced by uh, secondary porosity and dissolution. The other important topic that you probably could see is that due to the lateral variations in lithology and um, burial, what you have is uh, changes in porosity and permeability that are very marked laterally. That is that is an uncertainty that uh, that is important in isolated carbonate buildups. And the other uh, the other item that I think is important and is a positive aspect of isolated carbonate buildups is that the stratigraphic trap is defined by by deep marine sediments that are sealing usually these isolated carbonate buildups in an evolution that goes from high stand. In terms of uh, in secret stratigraphic terms, is essentially a transgression that drowns what is called the drowning of isolated carbonate buildups that we will discuss uh, later. So let's see how they look present day. So we have good analogs uh, at least on the on the geometry. And over here you can see clearly uh, the uh, uh, the platform on an underlying uh, topographic height. We always need for this isolated uh, carbonate buildups an, uh, an antecedent or underlying uh, previously formed 
uh, high. It can be a seamount in this case, which is uh, in the Indian Ocean. It can be uh, a volcano in the middle of the South Pacific or any basement high uh, that you can, you can find. So what you have here in A is, uh, is a classic uh, carb isolated carbonate platform. And let's take a look at the elements there. You have an internal lagoon, or we will call it inner platform in other cases, which is uh, an area with uh, very low energy, with a small rift when, you, when uh, possible. They are so-called patch rifts, as opposed to this rim, that we have here in, in green, sorry, uh, in uh, blue, and this is the reef itself. Then, as you can see, there is a very gentle slope to the lagoon and a very steep uh, slope toward uh, the basin. And, and these are the elements that we will discuss the lagoon or an inner platform, the reef itself, and the slope. And uh, what you can see is uh, you can have an idea of the very steep uh, slopes that I was uh, uh, discussing about. This picture, which actually is a good analog for several uh, large uh, fields in the world, uh, is very commonly seen in, uh, in some of these fields, as I said. And I hope you can keep that in mind because the geometry will be preserved and by differential compaction, which is the main driver for this uh, for these traps, they will form four-way closures. So an important element is differential compaction, and we will discuss it later, because they, they form, uh, they give uh, excellent trap geometries. Mm -hmm. And they're not related by, uh, on any kind of, of uh, folding or compressional uh, uh, force. It's just essentially, draping over over uh, uh, a high that by differential compaction uh, compacts less than the surrounding uh, softer sediments. So on A here, what you will see is satellite image of uh, what we just described. And uh, look at the dimensions, they're very big. In this particular case, you, you have clear here the rim, the rift. You see deeper colors here, which is deep water. This is the poor slope. Here, shallower is the what we call in the previous slide the lagoon. And you see those little dots are the little patch rifts that some of the times, given given uh, enough accommodation space, creates uh, a small rifts, a uh, small version of the of the of the rift margin in the in the lagoon. On B, you see a visualization of, uh, of, uh, in, of a seismic of those, uh, of those uh, rims. And in C, what you see here is the uh, discrimination or distribution of phases. And this is very important. And it's consistent throughout. And let's take a look at this first. You know, uh, When you see here in dark blue is the basinal phases, most of the times, this is the source rock that we will see other cases where methane is, uh, is, is the main um, hydrocarbon phase. But in general, source rock surrounds this isolated uh, carbonate buildup. So from the point of view of generation, and especially migration, these are focal areas, uh, uh, exceptional, I would say, in terms of trap geometry. Then you have here the slope phases, which is the secondary of you know, objective in some place, in some cases, Golden Lane in Mexico is a, is an atoll, is an isolated carbonate buildup, and it's uh, is uh, uh, the uh, the secondary reservoirs are carbonate uh, slope phases. Then we go into the main phases, which is this uh, pale orange or uh, light brown, which is the platform margin or the rift, and it can be uh, it is. Uh, in general, the best uh, reservoir. Then you go to the inner platform, we call it lagoon, with two variations, which is one is uh, high energy, and we will discuss it, and the other one is the is the background sedimentation, which is dominated by carbonate mud. And you will probably uh, you're familiar with the term uh, micritic muds. That is what we have. On top of that, what you see, light blue is 
is a, is a graphic depiction of what we call the drowning of a river, or in this case, an isolated carbon buildup. And that provides also the seal. So you see that the, the many elements of the play are here working uh, in an optimal way. Now let's see a little bit about the uh, evolution of how they evolve and they create these traps, this isolated carbonate buildups. And for that, I will borrow a, uh, a concept and a methodology very used in, uh, in plastic, which is called shoreline trajectory analysis. And imagine the shoreline, like in the Galveston Island for, uh, for plastics, that replace shoreline by reef margins and it works exactly the same and what it is is the relation between sedimentation relative sea level and, uh, and shoreline here the shoreline in this graphic are are uh, marked by this uh, dark blue line and the shoreline is defined as a cross section on the, on the depositional dip of how the shoreline trajectory changes uh, between uh, uh, basically uh, controlled by sedimentation, plastic sedimentation, or just organic productivity, which is the counterpart in, in carbonate sediments. So that interplay uh, helps a lot uh, to define the following. When you look at the normal regression, I'm, I, again, I'm using uh, plastic uh, nomenclature. You know, what you have here is uh, a point uh, where the ROS, where the shoreline is located at this time. Sea level goes up, and if it, there is enough plastic or organic productivity for the carbonates, what you have is a normal regression. When uh, the opposite of that is a transgression, and what you have is a backstepping um, imaging of the shoreline trajectory. So. Uh, you can think in terms of plastic terms. You have a shoreline retreating, like a beach uh, dune profile retreating constantly, like most of the coastlines uh, right now in the world. Or you can think that is prograding in a normal regression. So this methodology can be used also uh, very well in, um, in carbonates. I had a little problem. Bear with me for a second here. It's not working. Just give me a second. Okay, now it's working. It was just a slow. Sorry about that. So this is a possible pattern of sedimentation based on different relative. Uh, relation between sediment supply and, and essentially here is uh, organic productivity and relative sea level. And those circles that you saw in the first uh, diagram are applicable here. One that is particularly interesting in carbonates is when there is a delicate balance between organic productivity and sea level. Let's assume that sea level keeps going up and is in pace with uh, with the movement of the photic zone and therefore with the organic productivity and the carbonate buildup. Which, what you will find there is a systematic aggradation and phases, seismic phases, uh, as we will see, and the phases belts in terms of Wilson cycle will not change. It will always go up, up. So the lagoon phases will be always behind and the basinal phases will be always in front. That uh, I'm emphasizing that particularly because it's a very important uh, subtype in carbonates. Let's take a look at uh, one case where we can apply this uh, reef margin trajectory methodology uh, coming from a shoreline trajectory for plastic sediments. And let's take the Maldives, which is an excellent case of isolated carbonate platform. This is a cross section, we will see the seismic later. This is a cross section of uh, the Maldives platform. And on both sides, in blue, what you have is this rim of ribs. Uh, the first thing you will see is that this has uh, those elevated rims or fringes. 
and they have uh, an, uh, a lot of accommodation space in the platform. This goes back to the concept of the empty bucket model for carbonates, where uh, you have the, the rim with the rift, and in the middle you have a, a shallow inner platform where most of the times what you have is uh, mycritic mud dominated environments. So in blue here, you have the key, uh, the key target for your reservoir. And on both flanks, you will see there the four slope and the slumps and the breaches, the so-called breaches, carbonate breaches that are so very common. In this particular case, the antecedent surface or the high is volcanic basement. And this is in the Indian Ocean. So uh, th this is a case where the uh, high is uh, basement. So let's take a look a little bit of a, a, a line. The line to uh, the line uninterpreted line is good because they show uh, a couple of things. First, you see this wipeout here is related to the high impedance of carbonates in general compared to other rocks. So here, what you have is a candidate for the, the reef margin. As you can see here, where all this uh, later sediments are doing on lap, this is the four slope and this is a slope and this is the basin. So only on looking at that, you know the polarity of this uh, carbonate platform rim. In the back, where you have a facies that can be interpreted as mostly continuous laterally, although a little patchy, you know, with high impedance, that is the platform. And, and unless you have these discontinuities, it will be hard for you without this geometry and this model to figure out whether you are in the basin or in the platform. Below you have the interpretation. And the only thing I want to emphasize on this one is this that this little discontinuity is there, you know, with the mounded seismic faces with a, a flat and uh, convex uh, geometry overall, those are the small patch ribs, the small version of our uh, platform. Here in this case is, is, is essentially the same. You see the patch rib and the back rim, uh, the, 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 the most important, the, the margin with the rift, and you see clearly here all the patch rib. Let's take a look at this and let's do some uh, very fast uh, interpretation. In here, in the in, in interpreted line, we will we will use the shoreline trajectory concept to see the evolution of this uh, isolated platform. And um, when you look at uh, a couple of places, you see the onlap here. There is a there is a, a little high here. There is a second high in this position, and then it jumps all the way to here. Well, using the shoreline trajectory concept, we, we can say if this is a transgression or if you want a backstepping carbonate uh, uh, pattern. And the interpretation in the, well, one in this one, we just interpreted one, two, and three. What is happening here is the inner platform is shrinking because the sea level is uh, going too fast. And each time the photic zone is reinstated, restated, it is just in a backstepping uh, transgressing way. Just the same line here, go to the interpreted line, you will see here we color it and we have the backstepping pattern, very similar to what we call uh, in plastic system, uh, transgressive system track. So this is one, one way for this platforms to evolve. What is happening here is sea level, the rate of sea level rise is so fast that the photic zone cannot cannot uh, keep up in the same place and moves to a shallower area, which uh, is a good introduction for a general model, sequence stratigraphic model that repeats itself on and on for all these isolated carbonate platforms. On the left, you will see a, a very classic uh, model that starts with one here, start up, and you see the antecedent surface or the, the high. And that high, what it needs to is just to uh, just to start to be within the photic zone. As long as that uh, water depth is within the photic zone, 
and there is no plastic input, we will have um, enough bioproductivity and we will have the development of these uh, buildups. Then there is a time where sea level keeps pace with, with the photic zone of the productivity. So that is the main, number two, is the key stage of, of growth for this uh, platform. Then what happened? What is happening here is that after that, uh, the sea level doesn't, the rate of sea level rise is not as important as the bioproductivity or carbonate productivity. So what is happening is that we are technically reducing uh, accommodation space. So by reducing accommodation space, this carbonate, this excessive carbonate productivity needs to find places, and that's called the so-called high stand shedding into the lagoon and on into the basin. And that is represented at the stage three by that light blue uh, carbonate. Then the cycle uh, uh, comes to the low stem level where the sea level will drop and it will expose eventually uh, the isolated carbonate platform. In humid weather, and uh, where you have rain that is a slightly uh, acidic, you know, the pH, what you will have is uh, at that uh, sequence boundary, you will have a karstification, which is a very important uh, element in secondary porosity. So you see, we are, we are trying to connect the uh, sequence stratigraphic uh, framework of the isolated carbonates with the possibilities of uh, porosity development. And in stages one and two, needless to say, you will have uh, oolitic grainstones or uh, you will have uh, reefal limestones that will be driven by primary porosity given, you know, given conditions. And when you are in severial exposure, you have the option to increase uh, porosity by dissolution and by karstification. This and the, the other avenue that this can take is that uh, it reaches a point on, on, let's say, on the stage two, the sea level rise really is, uh, the rate is much faster than uh, organic productivity. So what happened? Uh, the photic zone uh, disappears and you have a fast transgression. And that is what is called the one way of, uh, killing all this uh, carbonate platform. We will see that in many cases, that's what happens. There are two ways of killing this isolated uh, platform, by sediment input, which is a stage number five, which is called platform drowning. That's, that's one way. And the other is a transgressive drowning uh, by jumping the sea level too, too high and uh, putting that uh, carbonate uh, reef that it was uh, building just too deep uh, beyond the photic zone. So the the next uh, the next slides are are essentially uh, a detailed explanation of that evolution with one through five, and I think we have been uh, through that already. So uh, let's move to some good examples uh, on seismic. We will see the classic seismic phases for isolated. Uh, platforms and the evolution of some of them, which is, I think, very important as well to uh, to see, uh, to give room at the end uh, to some um, subsurface uh, examples with some fields. Here is, a, in a nutshell, uh, the key seismic phases that we need to take a look at when we're looking at uh, a carbonate plate, particularly isolated platform. And you will see there one through six uh, mounted chaotic, which are the two, one and three, are uh, the two that characterize the rim, the mounted. Uh, if that rim is related more with olytic shows, that is not as cemented as the uh, reef buildups, you will have some clinoforms. The platform internal will be dominated, as we saw in the Maldives case, by high amplitude, laterally continuous 
seismic phases with bits and pieces of those areas of disruption that can be the patch reefs. And then we go to the other one, which is the parallel phases, which is the basinal phases, which is the, which is the one that probably is related coevally with uh, source rocks. So let's take a look at the evolution of this particular um, uh, Miocene, Pliocene platform. And here, what this study has done is to describe, again, the reef margin trajectories, which are uh, in uh, these are these points in green. And what you see what is happening here is that an entire isolated platform is shrinking by a systematic transgressive uh, transgression. The basinal phases on both flanks are doing all lap, and in this position are located here with the seismic phases characteristic that we just described. And then there is a next jump for the next stage, and you see how they're doing all lap at this level. So what is happening here, we put it in those circles. And I mean, in the class, we have a couple of exercises doing that is that this platform is in its way to be drowned by a transgression. Hmm? So keep that in mind, which is uh, uh, when we compare that to other cases. In this particular case, remember that we, we emphasized aggradation as a very typical evolution of this isolated carbonate buildups when we look at the shoreline trajectory nomenclature. Well, in here, you can see that this uh, very disruptive, chaotic, sometimes mounted seismic facies that one on top of the other, that's the classic seismic facies for the carbonate ribs. Hmm? Some authors describe it, or depending on, on the survey you're looking at, on the, on the quality of the seismic, sometimes it's mounted, sometimes it's chaotic, but for sure is always discontinued. And it's flanked on both sides, and here I think in this case it's very clear, by the basinal phases to the to the left, and you can see how this how continuous they are, and then uh, similar but not exactly similar uh, on the other side, elevated in terms of current stratigraphy. This interval here that I'm uh, I hope you can see that I'm uh, marking with my cursor here is higher than this because this is representing the slope, and as you see, the seismic phases are rather continuous, but not as continuous as, as the basinal ones. Why? Because probably there is a development of small patch reefs that give that discontinuity, lateral discontinuity of the seismic phases. But the most important thing here is that, that the shoreline trajectory, the margin reef trajectory is vertical, so you are aggrading. This is particularly good in terms of carbonate plates because you are stacking the best reservoirs one on top of the other. And if you're in deep water where economics are important, uh, it is very important to have a stack pay and, and create a larger graph rock volumes uh, that will not be given by, let's say, the case of the Maldives, where if there was constant transgression, so you have to put a well in each of those uh, uh, small uh, rifts. In here, there is another case from Western Australia where you clearly see how it's backstepping. You see the all lap on the southwest corner on, on the left. Uh, and you can see that it jumps all the way to the next to the next reef growth stage. Clearly, this is very similar to, <clears throat> to the, the first case that we saw. It's, uh, I referred to this slide. It's very similar to this. And you can see how it's drowned later by classic sedimentation. So these geometries are the ones you need to take a look at in order to uh, identify these carbonate, uh, isolated carbonates. There are several fields in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> uh, also in uh, the Mediterranean and in other places where these isolated platforms are, are very peculiar. Here you see on the left, the seismic of the Malampaya field, an isolated <clears throat> platform in the, in the Philippines, in, uh, offshore. Obviously, all these examples are offshore. And, and you see a sketch there where you have the uh, uh, distribution of faces with, uh, with the blue, uh, a grading one on top of the other, which is this area here where this 
continuity of uh, seismic phases becomes uh, critical. There is not much of uh, continuity. And you have a little bit of shading. Remember the back shading that I saw, that I uh, uh, mentioned uh, when we were talking about the sequence stratigraphic cycle, which is a secondary uh, high energy uh, reservoir. And then you go into the low energy inner platform or lagoon uh faces another another very interesting case i don't think the seismic is good but at least you can see the seismic you see uh the isolated carbonate buildups there is a here you have a again uh a, a seismic and, and you can see how distinctive this uh carbonates in seismic are let's take a look at uh, probably one of the best examples, which is the Tengiz field, handled by uh, Exxon, Chevron, and others with, with the government, with the local government. And, and this is very interesting because it's very well imaged, has produced and is producing a lot of oil, and is, is probably one of the classic cases of uh, isolated plasma. What you have there is a rendering of a visualization from seismic. The, the line here southwest, north, northeast, you can see uh, the isolated platform. This is in the Paleozoic, in the Bashkirian, in the Mississippian. And what you have here is the rim clearly shown. There is an area where there was a scarred slump, so it's open here. And you see the steep slope, you have the, the rim. And in this particular case, they were blessed also by uh, shading, uh, that high stand shading that I mentioned toward, uh, essentially toward the platform. So you will see uh, there is also some uh, potential, reservoir potential in this area other than on the rim. And there is also uh, some, some productivity, some production from the breaches of the slope. And this is in production and now they move to Coralev, which is a uh, satellite uh, isolated platform, which uh, uh, it has the same characteristics. And in here, just to show you very briefly, uh, the breaches, how this uh, started, look at the old water content, how low it is, it's in the Devonian, and all this, it's uh, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, essential, Mississippi. And what you have is, is a riff, that is a grading, so it's an aggradational pattern. That's why I emphasize similar to what we saw in the Philippines in the other seismic. In the other one was just a good analog. This is this is a field, hmm? and uh, deep deep here you have the the source well. So this has been in a very stable part uh, of the world. So with no folding, no compression, and has been growing in pace at least during uh, this this time of, of the Paleocene in pace with the uh, uh, sea level. This is just to give you an idea of interparticle porosity that dominates. This is not dominated by secondary porosity. That's interesting. So you have interparticle porosity and interparticle in the sense of a moldic because there are some bugs. And, and here I'm, I'm showing you interparticle porosity in grainstones. Here is an oolitic grainstone, uh, B and see how the deteriorates uh, uh, with a little bit of moldic porosity in D. But A and B are the, 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 key, the key reservoirs in this uh, isolated platform. And it's very interesting to see that there's a general, is a, there's a general discrimination. This is permeability versus porosity. The best petrophysical characteristics are, are related to the original primary porosity. As you know, in, uh, grainstones in the Dunham classification are the best carbonate reservoirs when we're talking about primary porosity, obviously. And paxtones are, are not that good. It's, it's a muddier, muddier version of uh, grainstones, much, much muddier. And it shows uh, this diagram that uh, uh, the petrophysical characteristics are in line with uh, with the primary porosity uh, concepts, you know. I want to close with uh, with another example that has some commonality with what we just saw. 
First of all, as you can see, in terms of uh, trapping mechanism, again, we're facing always this uh, exceptional four-way closure that by differential compaction gives a steep, uh, uh, steep limbs. Uh, so I would say that in terms of key risk, trap geometry and trap configuration is probably you know, not, not risky at all in this isolated carbonate plant. And this is a, a rather recent discovery, the SOAR gas discovery in the Levantine Basin. Uh, as you can see uh, here, you have the uh, Niger Delta with a lot of with a lot of production essentially coming from plastics. But when you go into the deeper zone, there is a series of highs, and there is a relatively new uh, play. And SOAR is probably the best with up to 30 uh, TCF in situ of gas and it's a big area and in this particular case is biogenic gas mm -hmm. in in this critician but the reservoir which is the interesting part is is an isolated carbonate platform uh, uh, case and, and this is a, a sketch and a line of this uh, ENI discovery the SOAR discovery there are others as well you know and this, uh, and I will just uh, stop here to show you uh, a little bit this diagram, then you go to the seismic, you know. You have the Miocene Reservoir in the area we were, we, we, where we could predict uh, the reef margins would be uh, the reservoirs located. Then uh, you have the focal point, the migration from not only the biogenic gas, in another discovery you have also a thermogenic component. But again, always remember, it's a focal point in a basin. And then to make it even better, in this particular case, we have the Messinian salt. Remember the Messinian um, salinity crisis in, uh, in the Mediterranean that is uh, very simple to identify all over. So that is a seal that covers all these highs. So you have all the elements of, uh, uh, for a uh, for a super uh, giant. And here in the seismic, every time you have a salt, whether it's here or the other case can be, probably you're aware of the free salt in, in Brazil, PSDM from the point of view of seismic is critical. Uh, previous to, to uh, good PSDM seismic, it was impossible to even image what it was below the salt, which is in both cases, mostly uh, autochthonous. It's not a lot of like in the Gulf of Mexico. And in here, in this seismic, I just want to highlight, uh, and we are closing here, you can clearly see the platform, and you see the whole lap of the basinal faces here following my cursor. And when you have here, is the base of the salt. So all the elements uh, that you need to have a mega discovery are here. You have uh, two, uh, source rock or two uh, uh, two contributions, the biogenic gas in the Miocene itself surrounded, and then you have a, a deeper Cretaceous Jurassic thermogenic uh, source rock. You have the isolated carbonate platform with the four ways that we have seen in, in during this presentation, with the optimal facies, which is on both margins, uh, on this margin and on this margin, a little bit of empty back geometry here with the platform, hmm? but uh, with the potential for secondary uh, reservoirs, and then a super top seal, and I don't need to expand on that, which is always uh, salt. So with that, I would conclude here this very brief uh, presentation of how this uh, isolated carbonate buildups are very important exploration targets and how they are becoming more and more common as we drill in this uh, offshore areas of the world. Not only not only the classic uh, places Southeast Asia, but a brand new uh, uh, play uh, in the Mediterranean. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, I want to remind our audience that while you are muted, you can post questions in the question feature there on the GoToWebinar uh, 
area and uh, you after today you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar that you can share with your colleagues. Uh, we'll ask you to provide some feedback and evaluation form and you'll get a link to the registration details for the course that Oscar Lopez Gamendi will be teaching for SCA in Houston September 24th through 28th on carbonate stratigraphy I'm sorry, Carbonate Sedimentology and Sequence Stratigraphy that's offered in Houston in September. So be sure and um, pose your questions now or uh, take an opportunity to consider registering for the class. So Oscar, the first question is, what are the risks that are associated with isolated carbonate buildups and how do you mitigate those risks? Well, the, the main risk I would say uh, is uh, reservoir variability. And not only in terms of uh, how important uh, secondary porosity and how difficult to predict secondary porosity is in carbon is unlike uh, in plastic reservoirs to a certain depth, uh, but also why the geometry itself. As you could see, we have a rim with very good uh, reservoirs all around these isolated platforms. And uh, sometimes that volumetric may not be enough. So I would say that Reservoir identification potential in the inner platform as well is probably the key risk. On the other end, what is almost a given in, in any of these isolated carbonate platforms is trap geometry. And, and they become not only, uh, you know, very good traps, but also uh, focal through through the their evolution, uh, focal point of migration. Thank you. So, Considering the emergence of the pre-salt play in Brazil, what analogs apply to that area of the world? It, technically talking, they are isolated platforms. The only thing, the, the, the couple of things that are different, uh, a little different. One is that um, the refill component is, a, is basically different. It's called a very peculiar uh, rock, which is my, microbial limestone, that technically, from the Proterozoic, you know, th there have been the, the the first reefs, if you want. So from that point of view, uh, is an analog, because those microbial limestone, they are limestones, though so they behave in the same way that any limestone. They need uh, an underlying high, and in in the pre-sol, the underlying high high is shoulders of half gravity. That is the only difference. So they are isolated by the morphology or the geometry of the trap is more related to uh, the half grabbing, how they evolve laterally. And I would say that that's the only difference. You know, they're not so circular, they're elongated uh, because of the shape of the underlying uh, basement height. So the next question regarding the lagoonal patch reefs. Is there a predictive method to determine if a certain platform geometry would be prone to develop patch reefs behind the fringing reef? Actually, there isn't. The only control that you have for the inner platform to develop this patch reef if, uh, is that there is, uh, these two controls are in pace within, within the inner platform, which is the sea level and uh, the productivity. As long as you keep, there's not a lot of, remember, there's not a lot of accommodation space in the inner platform. Therefore, the little accommodation space, if, if you have, if it's within the photic zone, you will develop those uh, small patch reef. But, but, but then again, it's a matter of dimensions. Seismically, it is very easy the, to identify, let me put it this way, to identify inner platforms with potential for patch reefs versus those who are not. And the seismic phase is, I think, is, is uh, analysis is very clear. When you start seeing discontinuities in an otherwise very high amplitude, laterally continuous seismic phases that you know that is within this uh, uh, platform, uh, when you see a lot of those discontinuities, that is a key that you have the potential for patch reef. When you see that in terms of seismic phases, you cannot, uh, 
I mean, the base interfaces are very similar to the platform, I would roll those out. So the patches clearly um, providing that discontinuity are also increasing the heterogeneity of of the reservoir. Uh, does the lagoonal facies tend to be more heterogeneous than the rim facies, the fringe facies? Yes, yes, because the rim is is dominated in oolitic shows by you know uh, oolitic uh, grain stems, or in the in the case of uh, riffle development by uh, by bounce stones or you know we have not discussed the classification of uh, carbonate but essentially highly cemented you know uh, corals you know that build uh, the rift at least today so that that is probably less uh, variable the issue in the platform is twofold you may have you may have oh, uh, th this three these three phases the patch reef that we mentioned that is a smaller version of, of the rim you have the low energy micritic mud and then you may have this high stand shedding which is essentially rework material from the rim going in into the platform but not very far from the rim itself so indeed there is much more variability in the in the platform however in the tangis field uh there are several good uh, uh, wells close to the reef margin, technically in the, in the lagoon, that uh, there are exceptional wells in terms of EUR. Could you elaborate on the oil water conduct, contact in the Tengiz field? I, I think you mentioned that in your presentation. Yeah, if you notice the oil water contact is very low. Uh, it's uh, technically in the Devonian. What has happened, and so uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that everywhere you have the same all water content, but the lowest all water content is down there. So it, it is telling you several things, that there is continuity and there is a pace. Uh, let me put it this way. This reef margins have been growing in a way, in the same way that the seismic phases from uh, Natuna Sea that I show, where you have one over the other and with no interleaving mudstone that will create baffles or, or seals. So it is essentially a very paced, yeah, very uh, in sync evolution of this rift. And the old water content is, 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 is very, very low. So on one of your slides, you showed the ocean word uh, side of the reef uh, exhibiting aggradation and the landward margin exhibiting the back stepping phenomenon, which would provide the better reservoir rock. Sorry, can you repeat? I, I, it broke uh, here. Yes, and in one of your slides, you showed yes. the oceanward mm -hmm. side of the platform with aggradation and the landward side exhibiting the back stepping deposition which would provide the better reservoir quality rock in general when you're facing the basin the only option to have a good potential reservoir is the so-called tailless breaches uh, when you have time but there is a classic golden lane uh, in Costa Rica in Mexico it has a couple of phases that the classic phases on the rim and then a tailless breccia that in some cases is uh, as secondary porosity, and that's the only the only target just adjacent and next to the rift. I would say that uh, if you if you need to go either way, I would go to the platform because of this uh, high stand back shedding. You know that is very common when the accommodation space is very uh, small and productivity since since the carbonate buildup is within the photic zone keeps growing and it, it tends it tends to grow internally and rework gravity by gravity currents toward the basin but i, I would go definitely uh to the container that is in the back uh, uh, i.e the the lagoon yeah so is there an opportunity to uh, see some of these phenomena in modern day carbonate reefs um, particularly with respect to rising levels Sea levels. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The most common feature in uh, in in reason and sub reason and in Asian as well, you know, uh, uh, cases of uh, how how a reef evolves and dies is by uh, transition system by transgressions. Actually, as you know, we we live uh, in a transition system track after the you know the Pleistocene glaciation uh, that we have accelerated. I mean. Mankind obviously has accelerated that, but the mechanism is as follows: You know, uh, when you have a sea level rise that is rising, the sea level is rising too fast. Uh, the the photic zone will be up there, and your high will be below the photic zone, and the buildup will will remain there and die. So that is the most classic way how a reef dies. Now, that's the bad part. The good part is that what that uh, provides is a lot of uh, hemipelagic mud above this uh, isolated carbonate platforms. And unlike SOAR discovery, which is salt, in this particular, uh, in these other particular cases, in other particular cases uh, all around the world, what you have is uh, an excellent seal as well. So is there a difference in the isolated carbonate reefs and pinnacle reefs? Or is, is that the same thing? It's the same thing, essentially. Okay. Uh, pinnacle, pinnacle when, when you look at the Maldives, when you have both rims and the platform in the middle, uh, we call it is it, an isolated carbonate buildup. Now, if you have this tendency for the, for the reef margin to a uh, sudden transgression to keep retrograding, uh, if you catch that at the last stage, you will have a pinnacle. And, and the pinnacle is just a description from the seismic or, or you know, geomorphologic. Yeah. But it's the same. Very good. Well, that's the last of the questions we have for you today, Oscar. Uh, we'd like to thank our audience for attending today. Again, you'll get a link to Oscar's class that he teaches on carbonate sedimentology and sequence stratigraphy offered September 24th through 28th in Houston, Texas at SCA's office. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>